introduction and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to, to share my group's uh, science with the community, right? And we're all here um, because of parahydrogen, right? And when we make parahydrogen, basically it's based on the temperature. And so far what I've seen is that most of these uh, parahydrogen generators operate in two different regimes of, of temperature. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of people use liquid nitrogen as that cooling factor, and that gives you about 50% parahydrogen. And if you want to, you can go a bit lower in temperature down to around 20, 25 Kelvin, right where hydrogen is gonna start to liquefy. And that gives you 99 to 100% parahydrogen, right? Um, you can buy these off the shelf. They cost a little bit of money. You can make your own. They cost a little bit of money and also a little bit of time and expertise to put them together. And so uh, I'm a newish faculty member at Rowan University and Rowan is a predominantly undergraduate institution. And that means I don't have a team of graduate students and postdocs that I point at and say, go, go do research. Um, it's basically me and a rotating crew of undergrads uh, performing science with an operating budget that is on par with beer money, right? And so uh, parahydrogen in general is a really, really attractive field and using liquid nitrogen to make it is also quite attractive as well, uh, mostly because it's quite simple and cheap to make the parahydrogen generator when you cool it with liquid nitrogen, and it's pretty simple and cheap to operate it as well. Uh, so it has a lot of pluses going for it. The really only downside is, is you only get that 50% parahydrogen. And maybe your application could benefit from a slight boost in, in parahydrogen percentage, right? Um, and so that's kind of the, the theme of, of the short talk. And so here's a picture of uh, our lab's very humble hydrogen setup. Uh, the only thing we actually spent money on was the liquid nitrogen doer, uh, which I bought for this exact study in mind. And we also splurged on a flow controller. The rest of it was put together with bits and pieces uh, that we found around the physics department, uh, not counting the benchtop NMR, right? And so we use liquid nitrogen uh, to, to make our parahydrogen. And that, of course, boils at 77 Kelvin. Uh, but you can make colder liquid nitrogen, right? Even though it's at 77 Kelvin, the triple points down around 63 Kelvin, right? Um, and before doing all of this, when I was a postdoc, I did some DNP. And if you've done DNP, you know, use the sample has to be really, really cold. So cold they use liquid helium to cool it. And even that's not good enough. Uh, you pull a vacuum on the liquid helium to lower the temperature just a little bit more. And so the idea with this is basically, can we use that type of, of approach uh, to lower the temperature of the liquid nitrogen using vacuum pump uh, to get closer to the triple point, uh, because when you can get that liquid nitrogen a little bit colder, uh, you should be able to generate some useful increase in the amount of parahydrogen that you're generating. And you can figure out how much, right? You can just calculate it based on the temperature. And as you move from the boiling temperature to the triple point, uh, you should be able to expect an increase from around your 50% up to about 63% of parahydrogen. It's not a huge increase, uh, but it's potentially useful, right? Uh, and so basically the challenge that we set for ourselves is can we use a, a fairly cost-effective and simple to use uh, parahydrogen setup that takes advantage of this approach to give us you know, a, a, an appreciable increase in parahydrogen percentage. And so that's what we went about doing. Uh, so here's a photo of our setup. The photo on the left is kind of the overall uh, uh, setup. The one on the right kind of focuses in on the top of the liquid nitrogen doer. And the short, the short version of the story is we hooked up a vacuum pump and pulled the vacuum on it, right? Uh, but basically um, we used a, a little rubber stopper that I think I got out of an Erlenmeyer flask somewhere uh, as a lid for the liquid nitrogen doer just to make it airtight. We drilled four holes in it. So that way we had two holes for the the hydrogen gas to get in and get out through that conversion coil. Um, we had one hole to allow us to access the vacuum pump into that airspace above the liquid and inside the doer. And we also, uh, we were interested in looking at, you know, the, um, the pressure inside. So we have a vacuum base, we monitor the pressure. And we were also interested in monitoring the temperature, right? So the, the fourth hole uh, was to allow us to feed through a thermocouple so we could directly measure the temperature of the liquid nitrogen itself while we're pumping on it. And our second thermocouple, we actually threaded down into the parahydrogen generator coil through our copper tubing. So it rested a little bit above where we expect our conversion catalyst, our iron hydroxide catalyst to reside. We take the temperature of the gas and of the liquid while it's evacuating. Um, oops. 
trigger happy, sorry. Um, and so we monitored this over the course of an hour um, for, for a range of different conditions. And we can see that, you know, basically we start at atmospheric pressure and room temperature, and it very quickly drops um, in, in pressure, definitely. Um, we were able to pump down to a steady state of around 15 torr. That took about 15 to 20 minutes to get there, and it stayed pretty flat once we did. And as that was happening, uh, the temperature of our liquid nitrogen and our hydrogen gas also dropped as well. It dropped from room temperature to 77 Kelvin, and then slowly dropped down to around 63 Kelvin. And the temperature of the, the pair hydrogen gas and the liquid nitrogen itself, uh, they tracked very, very well together. That's a kind of blue and red dotted curves uh, we see in the middle. And we ran these experiments, not just with the vacuum pump, but we did the same thing again without the vacuum pump as a control. And so with those, as expected, the temperature stayed flat at 77 Kelvin the whole time that we were doing it, right? And the pressure under those would have been atmosphere. Uh, this is the one at 60 milliliters per minute. We ran this at different flow rates. These curves all look very similar. This one just kind of represents Okay, so um, after our hour was up, we collected our parahydrogen samples into a valved uh, NMR tube that we'd already evacuated down to 0.1 tor. Uh, we took it upstairs in chemistry and did NMR on it on a 400 megahertz system. Um, and then we waited two days and we did NMR on the same tube again. And we got you know, our initial low tiny signal with the parahydrogen uh, mostly in it. Um, and then when it's just relaxed back to its normal thermal equilibrium, um, ratio, then you get a little bit more signal as well. You can take the ratio of the signals to figure out how much parahydrogen that you had originally made in the first place. And so we did this at both temperatures, both with the vacuum at 63 Kelvin and also without a vacuum at 77 Kelvin. Uh, so the, that control is the red line. The colder one is the blue line above it. Um, and we did this at different flow rates. So everything from 20 milliliters per minute up to a thousand milliliters per minute. And we did each data point three times. So we have an average and standard deviation to report with it. And so under our, our regular liquid nitrogen temperatures, we get around 50 to 52% parahydrogen. Uh, it drops off a little bit as we increase the flow rate, but not by very much. When we use the vacuum pump to cool the liquid nitrogen as expected, we can generate higher amounts, higher fractions of parahydrogen, upwards of around 65% or so. Um, and that stayed fairly constant without the, throughout the different flow rates as well. And so, you know, we can, we can look at that and see like, yes, you know, we've actually, we've, we've accomplished something. Are we, we you know, it, it's gone the way we thought it would. And we can compare it even more. Um, whenever you look at the vacuum versus the control, which would be the blue bar versus the red bar, um, we can see that, yes, we, we have good, we have good confidence that we did something. There's a difference here. Um, and also we can compare what we found experimentally with what we expected to find whenever you just run through the math. Um, and with the control, it, it matched up really, really well. That's the red and the orange curves here for the experimental versus the theory. Uh, really, really close. We got exactly what we expected to get. With the vacuum one, which is the blue and the green, we did a little bit better experimentally than we think we should have. Um, and basically what that comes down to, I'm pretty sure is just how we calibrated the temperature sensor. Um, I think that, you know, we're, it was probably a little bit colder than we thought it was. Uh, basically the, the temperature sensor is well calibrated at 77 Kelvin, because that's a very easy thing to do. Once it gets below 77 K, you've got this kind of sliding scale of calibration. And it's not as easy, like at 77K, you just dump it in liquid nitrogen and see what it is and you're good to go. If, when, it's, when it's not, you've got you've to rely on that calibration data. I think we're a little bit off. Um, so I think that you know, the green bar should be a little bit higher, uh, so to speak. And honestly, the difference between the green and the blue columns is equivalent to about two degrees. Kelvin. So it's not some huge difference uh, as well. So it's something we're, we're trying to kind of wrap up before we put a bow on it. Um, and so that is basically the main gist of it. And if you've seen this and you thought like, well, that looks easy and I can do this, um, I, I would say it is and, and you should. And if you do, then some places to improve would basically be to get a better vacuum pump. Our vacuum pump, I, I literally drug out of a barn um, it had been sitting there for I don't know how long and I wiped the dust off of it and I plugged it in and it worked. So we used it. That's it. End of story. If you have a better vacuum pump, you might be able to get a little bit even lower pressure to generate a slightly lower temperature. Um, our connections are just like push fit through a rubber tube with a little bit of vacuum grease in there as well. If you are more meticulous with your airtight connections, you might be able to get a little bit better results. And also, um, we had a very small port 
for the vacuum. Um, it was a quarter inch copper tube, which is about like trying to empty a, um, a, a swimming pool using a drinking straw. Um, if you had a larger port for the vacuum, um, you might be able to, to get slightly better results. Of course, uh, you know, we went from 77 down to 63 Kelvin, and that is the triple point. Uh, I think you can make some improvements, get down around 55. That would give you over 70% para hydrogen. The one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that if you're below the triple point, your nitrogen should start freezing at some point, pretty close to the triple point. Um, and so how big of a problem that is, is uh, perhaps up for you to discover. I don't actually know. I don't think we never really saw solid nitrogen. We worried about it before we started, and then it turned out to not be a problem. And so um, I think it's a function of how cold you go and how long you're there. If you have slushy nitrogen, it's probably okay. If you have a solid block of nitrogen ice, you're probably not gonna have as good thermal contact with your conversion coil. You're probably going to end up um, at, at some point melting and evaporating and then having a gap in between the nitrogen ice and the conversion coil and it's not gonna work as well for you. But uh, that's, that's an area to be explored, I suppose. So, so far my group, we haven't been in parahydrogen for very long, but we mostly just looked at kind of fundamental studies of how to make parahydrogen, how to characterize it. Moving forward, we'll probably move more towards into applications. Uh, we're mostly interested in gas phase contrast agents. So using parahydrogen, instead of bubbling into a liquid, can we enhance the, the, the MR signal of other gas phase molecules? Um, and also, can we enhance the signal of silicon 29, have some background in silicon, uh, magnetic resonance imaging and be interesting if we can apply some of that toward uh, from parahydrogen as well. And so um, this study was basically done by undergrads. Here they are right here. Uh, Yash just recently graduated and Elodie, Chris, and Jim are coming back for their senior year um, in, in September. So I'll see them around. Uh, and honestly, this was all done in the spring semester as part of a course that we have here in the physics department that our majors take. They do research in a lab for a semester or two. And this is what they did in the spring semester. And, and the nice thing about it, this was during our, our COVID um, protocol. So we could only have one student in the lab at a time, right? Um, and so I think they were able to accomplish a good amount in that short amount of time. Um, we also had a poster that was presented earlier today. I typically, this would be the point where you advertise it. Since it's already over with, I'm just gonna brag about it. And so we had other students that contributed to that work. James Sack um, did the poster today earlier, and that was using Raman scattering to look at um, how parahydrogen converts back to its normal isomeric abundance uh, in glass in MR tubes, which glass has a lot of paramagnetic, paramagnetic impurities in it, um, where we coat the inside of the glass with distance refractors. So I think that's about all I have. I thank you for your, your time and your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, great stuff, uh, Nick. That's very, that a very wonderful presentation. And also, I really like um, your setup. is like very in, 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 like very uh, very nice. It's, it's, thank you so much. Um, uh, we have a question from Steve here. Can the temperature be maintained for a while, or does it use up the liquid nitrogen quickly? So we always, we only ran for an hour and we just want to keep it consistent for everything. And I would say we probably used between a fourth and a third of the liquid nitrogen that we had. It's a 10 liter doer and we started with it all the way at the top. Um, and I don't know if that rate will change as it gets lower and lower. You might see an acceleration or deceleration. Um, so I think you could probably go for a couple of hours but you won't be able to go indefinitely. Right? So at some point, um, it won't work anymore. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Um, uh, so about making solid nitrogen, I mean, one, when we were playing around with something like this a long time ago, we found that we couldn't avoid forming it. And I think maybe it was because our pump was too good. This was when we were trying to actually uh, make calm <laughs> liquid nitrogen. We were trying to get a, a laser beam through, uh, through a cryostat, right? and uh, it formed that solid pretty quickly and it got out of hand and was very unstable. And so I actually wonder whether you've done yourself a benefit accidentally by having a not great pump. Potentially, right? Because it was, it was a problem that we worried about and then it didn't turn out to be a problem at all. Um, and so I would say, yeah, if you, get, if, you, if you have a better pump, you will run into it. I just don't know where, and I, I think it's a, how cold you go and how long you're there for. And, um, if it forms solid, if it forms like a slush, you know, you have those things. 
Well, it formed a skin on top that got thicker and it was uh, it was not a stable thing in our hands. So uh, right. That was the naphthalene just... work. Yes, that's right. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, there's a question here for Michael. It says, uh, were you able to quantify the function of power hydrogen with your bench tops that we as well? Surprisingly, no. And I, other people do. And I'm, 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 I'm sure that, that I'm probably just doing something wrong, honestly. Um, we've always just gone upstairs. I think the one difference with my, with my bench top NMR is that it's three channels and they stole the, the lock channel um, to, to make the third channel. So I can detect proton, carbon, and silicon with it, which is nice, um, except that for some reason, it doesn't seem to come through on it. We've tried a bit. Um, I, we haven't toyed around with it a ton. It was just kind of, we tried it, didn't see anything, went upstairs, saw something, kept going upstairs. Um, so I think it's, it should be possible to 